Good afternoon and welcome to the Ashtay Technology Holdings PLC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors are in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply click Q&A, scroll to the bottom, type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Ingrid Stewart, CFO and Alan Piri, CEO. Good afternoon. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Alan Cray. I'm the CEO. I joined Ashley Technology in 2009 as CFO. I became CEO in 2012. Um, my career background is I trained with KPMG in Aberdeen, left the profession in 1999, and I've been in subsea services businesses ever since. Um, and I, as I said, I've been with Ashley since 2009. And I'm Andrew Stewart. I'm CFO. I joined the business in January 2021. Um, prior to that, I started my career with Deloitte, very trained, moved very quickly into corporate finance and I qualified, spent the first 16 years of my career in professional services with Deloitte and then last year as a director at the Simmons Energy uh, practice. And then uh, joined industry with Enamec, which is a mechanical uh, services business. I was there for eight years as corporate development director. So a quick uh, company history. Ashford started in Aberdeen in 1985, entrepreneurial start. It was acquired by Ashted Group uh, PLC in 1990, who held the business until 2008, when it was acquired by Phoenix Equity Partners, a London-based uh, mid-market PE house, uh, who held the business until 2016, when it was acquired by Buckthorn Partners and Apicor. I, as I said, I joined the business in 2009. But we cut the, the last decade into two parts. Uh, the first part of the decade was very much uh, strengthening the foundations of the business. We upgraded the management team, we upgraded the facilities, we put a new ERP system in place, we divested of an onshore business that we had in the US, and that really created the foundation to be able to grow uh, the business, which we did in the period uh, 16 through 20, just before COVID hit, uh, not only by growing the business organically, but by doing five acquisitions. And that was all to increase the breadth, depth, and reach of the business. So what are we? We're a subsidy technology and rental uh, business. Uh, we support the installation, inspection, maintenance, repair and decommissioning of offshore uh, energy infrastructure. We're the market leaders in what we do. We've been doing it for 37 years. We've got a strong uh, track record supporting the largest subsidy contractors uh, globally. We've got two end markets. Uh, oil and gas has been very much a focus of our business uh, since the beginning. And in recent years, we've been building up position in offshore wind. The roots of our business are obviously very much in oil and gas, but our journey into offshore wind has been one that's been pulled by our customers because it's exactly the same techniques and equipment that's required to do tasks subsea across both end markets. And that's one of the reasons why we've got some great uh, exposure to the fast growing offshore wind market. Our equipment fleet consists of uh, 17,000 items, it's very well invested, uh, highly uh, fungible, 85% fungibility between both end markets. And our equipment is highly mobile as well. So we can move it in air freight around the world uh, very easily. So we're not tied to any one geography. So what do we do? You know, we support uh, both the wind and offshore market. Uh, the wind activity is very much in the construction phase at the moment. Uh, whilst our oil and gas activities are focused on inspection, maintenance, repair, and decommissioning. We do this through three uh, service lines. Survey Robotics is the provision of electronic uh, equipment uh, for survey, navigation, and subsea operations. Uh, that counts for broadly 58% of our revenue. Mechanical solutions we've been building out through uh, m and in recent years, and now accounts for 34% of our revenue and asset integrity is uh, solving customers' problems by packaging equipment uh, together, both mechanical and serving robotics, so that we can collect the data, so that our customers can then analyze that data to determine what intervention is required on their subsea assets, if, if any. So we're building out a three-legged stool uh, to do more for our customers, but to put that into action and, and put it across visually when I begin to run a, a short video.
so hopefully that will just to give you a, a better feel sort of visually for you know, what our business is all about. So the next few slides are very much focused on our first half trading. You know, it's a really exciting time for the business. We're trading strongly. The market is creating a strong growth runway for us. And at the time of the IPO, we talked about a perfect storm being created and a number of features were coming together to create that strong growth runway. And what we've seen is that that runway has steepened and lengthened uh, in, in recent times. So first half results, 28.5% uh, uh, revenue growth for the period. Uh, for the first time in you know, a long time, we've actually seen higher growth from coming from oil and gas. It's 30% versus 26% in offshore wind. And we'll talk a bit, uh, a bit more about that in a minute. We're seeing increase in cost utilization. We're seeing increases in pricing. We've done a number of things to position the business for further growth. We've invested uh, 7.6 million in CapEx uh, so far in the, in the first half of the year. We pulled forward CapEx to make sure that we didn't get caught with any supply chain challenges. We've strengthened the senior management team, which we'll talk about a bit later. And we also increased headcount by 7%. We've expanded facilities, uh, not only in West Hill, but we're in the process of doing the same in the US. We've achieved ISO certification for health and safety and environmental uh, for the first time. That may not necessarily win us new work, but we're very much focused on building strong foundations to support continued growth in the business. So actually having processes and procedures in the business that are externally audited and verified on an annual basis is part of that uh, plan. We're very much focused on uh, continuing growth and not only organically, but through m and and part of that is uh, consolidating a fragmented market. We're delighted uh, to say that we signed uh, the acquisition of We Sub C a week past Friday. When we look at the market, you know, the key change that has happened since we IPO'd uh, in November last year is the focus on uh, energy security and energy affordability. That has definitely uh, provided an increase in oil and gas activity but we are very much focused on the energy transition. We came to market as an energy transition uh, theme, and that is still very much uh, what we're focused on. With that background and you know, the forward look for the rest of the year, the board is increased, increasingly confident about the outlook uh, for the business, and we expect FY22 to be at least in line with market expectations. I'll hand over to Ingrid, who will talk us through some numbers, and then I'll come back and talk about the market and some other operational aspects. Well, thank you. So we're very pleased with the performance of the business across all our metrics in the first half of the year. The results are very much in line with expectations and up significantly on the prior year. The market has strengthened through FY22, and that's allowed us to increase utilisation and also to push pricing, and we've got some slides coming up later on that. It's worth noting that when you compare FY22 with the first, or HY22 with the first half of last year, uh, last year was very much a year of two halves, so the first half being much more impacted by COVID than the second half. So bearing that in mind when you're, when you're looking at these numbers. But in terms of where we're at, you know, 28.5% growth in revenue, you know, 48% growth in EBITDA, delivering margins, 25.8% EBITDA margins, which translate to a ROIC of 19%, all up on the full year results. And you know, in terms of balance sheet, a very strong balance sheet uh, position at 0.9 times uh, leverage. When you look at that um, historically, for those of you that haven't seen this graph before, the dark blue uh, bars in, in, the, in the full year results are our actuals. And then what we've done here is we've layered on in the yellow the um, form of the acquisitions that we've done. So you can see the, the growth that the business that the business was in prior to COVID, the impact that, that COVID had on the business, and then the growth since. You know, top line growth, um, as I said, 28.5% uh, in the half year comparison to last year. Um, EBITDA margins of 39%, and um, reasonably consistently kind of around about 40% EBITDA margins delivered in this business. Um, we are down slightly on prior year, and that's really just as a result of the business line mix, but also the reintroduction of some costs post-COVID, uh, the biggest one being the reintroduction of a bonus scheme, which we haven't paid out on since 2019. And we've also, um, in these numbers, got our first uh, period of listed company costs as well. Um, overall, delivering an adjusted EBITDA of 25.8%, and that is actually a higher percentage than we achieved during our pre-COVID uh, higher years. Our revenue growth continued to come from both oil and gas and renewable markets. 
Um, as Alan said, 30% from oil and gas, 20, just under 26% from renewables. We've seen um, for the first time in a while, oil and gas grow higher than renewables. We've really seen a, a, a resurgence of oil and gas activity due to concerns around energy security. A gross margin has improved due to the mix of business and improved pricing, but we've also increased admin costs, as I, as I mentioned in the previous slide. But overall, higher activity has a strong flow through to the bottom line on our PM. On cash flow, there are three kind of major areas to focus on on, on cash flow. It's EBITDA, uh, working capital, and capex are really the three areas that move um, or, or that drive the cash flow. And um, we've seen a slight on working capital, we've seen a slight improvement on debtor days uh, since the year end. Our creditors have also increased as a result of our increased capex spend. And so despite the increase in revenue, that has resulted in a minimal in, minimal impact in the first half from working capital. Our capex of 7.6 million in page one, and um, we've actually pulled forward quite a, a significant chunk of our capex spend um, for the full year. Our, our budget for the year was low double digits. And we, just, we chose to spend the capex early to make sure that we could minimize uh, lead times and also make sure we had the kits available for the busy summer period. Overall free cash flow conversion, um, when you look at the two uh, halves together, are broadly in line uh, with the prior period. As I said, we've got a very strong balance sheet with net debt uh, down at 0.9%, uh, 0.9 times EBITDA. Our target net debt level is one to two times, um, and that is our, our sort of medium term target, thinking about MA uh, going forward. I'll come on to capital allocation in, uh, in a minute. In terms of working capital, as I said, you know, uh, our debt of deals have come down slightly, and that has allowed us to reduce our working capital as a percentage of LTM revenue, um, as well as obviously as a result of the CapEx creditor increase. Our ROIC, as a result of the improved um, EBITDA, has uh, increased to 19%. Just moving on to the capital allocation. In terms of our priorities for growth, and um, we see these coming under three, um, three sort of stools. Uh, firstly, organic uh, fleet growth. And we have been focusing on organic growth uh, through the first half of the year, investing 7.6 million in CapEx during that period. In terms of M&A, uh, we signed our first acquisition two Fridays ago, and we're continuing to build our pipeline for M&A opportunities. Being mindful of both current organic and M&A opportunities, we intend to declare our first dividend in conjunction with our final results for FY22. Um, by way of reminder for those that we've spoken to before, um, you'll be aware that we very much see this as a growth stock, um, but we have consistently talked about introducing a small progressive dividend. We recognise that that's important to some investors, but it also creates capital discipline across the business. Great, thanks so much, Ingrid. Uh, so the next slide focuses on the market before we, we get into more operational uh, matters. So as I said at the start, you know, the market's creating a strong growth runway for us. The graph on the left-hand side of the page is showing a KGAR, growth KGAR of 16% uh, from 2021 through 2025. There was a similar Slide or similar graph included in the emission document at IPO time, which showed 11%. So there's been very little movement in, in offshore wind, it's gone from 19% to 20%. The big change has been in oil and gas, subsidy inspection, maintenance, fair, and construction support, which has gone from 7% to 14%. Some of that has obviously been driven by the events in Ukraine, uh, which has really you know, brought into focus energy security and energy affordability, which is now obviously headline news and impacting you know, the general public. What we've seen so far in 2022 is an uptick in oil and gas activity, recognizing that it actually takes time for operators to put plans in place. And we are uh, a business that gets involved right at the end when we splash the water. So before you get to that point, there's the front engineering that needs to be done, there's the procurement that needs to be done. So you know, we are of the view that we haven't really seen the impact of you know, increased oil and gas activity that's been uh, that, that is coming our way because of the events in Ukraine yet. That will come through 23, 24, and 25. There has uh, been some noise around uh, minor delays in offshore wind uh, projects. You know, that is to be expected because delays and offshore are two words that generally go together. Offshore wind is uh, more exposed to inflationary pressures than, than oil and gas, given the contracting background, because a lot of those projects are at procurement and installation phase. 
However, you know, the outlook for offshore wind is as strong as it's ever been. And we you know, definitely see a market that's at inflection point where you know, access to vessels, to people, to equipment is getting tight. We've got an offshore wind market that's the biggest that's ever been in history. And we've got an oil and gas market that's coming back quite strongly. So as we look into the future, you know, what do we see? Oil and gas uh, operators are recording record free cash flows. Um, free cash flow from oil and gas upstream activities uh, last year was something like 810 billion forecast for this year is 1.4 trillion so there is a wall of cash that's being generated some of that will find its way back to investors uh, in various forms through dividends and uh, share buybacks and the like but we, we we fully expect some of that to be invested in accelerating the energy transition whether it's offshore wind in hydrogen and solar uh, but also to extend uh, field life, extend production, and, and also stimulate uh, constru new construction work in oil and gas. So when we look at all these factors, you know, we see a strength in the market that is fundamentally better than when we, when we IPO'd. And we are very well placed to benefit both from the uplift in oil and gas and offshore wind, given the transferability of skills and capability that we've got in the business and the fact that our fleet is highly fungible. So how does that translate into what we're seeing in the, in the business? We're seeing tightening market conditions. Uh, quote activity by value is 29% 20, higher in the first half versus the prior year. Now, I think that is a proxy uh, for market uh, activity rather than necessarily a revenue because within that there will be bid for bid. Uh, so not everything in that uh, quote activity is something that we can win. Cost utilization is now at 44%. We've pointed in the past to uh, a good utilization, cost utilization target for us being a 45% plus. And from the, the pricing graph, you can see that we are also you know, being increasing pricing. There are inflationary aspects uh, to our business. Uh, the, the obvious place is payroll. Uh, the cost of new equipment is also increasing but the increases that we're getting from pricing is offsetting any uh, inflation that we're seeing. Excuse me. Uh, one of the challenges uh, that, that we're currently facing is, uh, is the shortage of people, uh, certainly quality people. We have increased headcount by 7% uh, through uh, the first half of the year. We now have a headcount uh, at June of 219. We've added to that subsequently. We're delighted to say that we've strengthened the senior management team. We have Phil Middleton has joined us as serving robotics director. That's a brand new role uh, to look after that service line. Ross McLeod, who's been with us uh, for so over 10 years uh, in an asset integrity role, uh, has been promoted to integrated projects director to you know, look after uh, larger projects that span the three service lines. And we're delighted that Bob Gillespie has joined us a couple of weeks ago as commercial director. Bob's Background is uh, from the contractor or from the customer set, uh, Food Road Technique, McDermott, Dolph, being some of uh, his previous employers. Culture is also you know, very important. We've introduced things like the Star Awards, which is a peer to peer uh, recognition program, uh, which is, is gaining traction. As I said earlier, we've, we've you know, secured ISO certification for health and safety and environmental to. Uh, strengthen the foundations of the business, and we've also uh, expanded uh, facilities. So we're taking a number of actions, not only uh, to, to grow the business, but to you know, put in place um, strengthened foundations uh, for growth going forward. One of the fourth growth, one of the four growth drivers that we spoke about at IPO time was was M and A, and we developed our M and A strategy in 2015 prior to Buckthorn and Apicorp acquiring the business. And it's very straightforward, it's to consolidate the fragmented market, to build up business of international scale to do more for our existing customers. And central to that is uh, expanding geographically, expanding the range of products and services, and also expanding into wind. And whether we look at it through the lens of our four regions, whether it's through the three service lines or the two end markets, there's multiple opportunities for us to grow and develop uh, through m and we're delighted to say that we have signed uh, the SPA for the acquisition of WeSubsea. Uh, and this is 
know, almost a textbook example of uh, Ashton Technology uh, acquisitions, a privately owned business, an off-market deal, technology that's highly complementary to existing uh, mechanical uh, equipment range, consolidates a fragmented market. We can internationalize uh, the, the products through the Ashton network. We can refocus the efforts of the business towards renewables. It's highly attractive uh, from a multiple perspective. Last year, it generated 58% EBITDA margin and 47% EBITDA margin. So, you know, we're delighted uh, to have, have got this acquisition signed and we will complete uh, the deal in Q4 of this year. So when we look at uh, the, the outlook for this business, you know, as I said, the, the business is trading strongly. The business is very well placed to benefit from the changes in the market. We've got increased confidence in the medium term uh, outlook uh, for the business that is supported by the likes of you know the data that's coming from Rystad that we that we spoke about earlier. We're seeing higher customer propensity to rent, uh, which is driven by uh, some supply challenges uh, within the market. Um, we are we are confident that we can continue to make good progress, uh, not only organically but through through M&A, uh, you know, through this year and next. On a cautionary note, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty in the world. You know, there's, there's obviously inflationary factors, but energy is at the center of, of the big debate. We feel that we're very well placed to benefit uh, from that. And therefore, you know, the board uh, is increasingly confident about the, you know, the outturn for this year to be at least in line with market expectations. And then finally, you know, this is the, the final slide that we showed at IPO stage. I think we've made good progress uh, as a PLC uh, since November. And when we look at these six uh, points, each of these six points are stronger today than they were in November last year. You know, we've got great exposure to the offshore renewables market that's continued to go from strength to strength. There has definitely been an uptick, uptick in, in oil and gas activity. Customer propensity to rent is increasing given the uh, increase in market activity and supply chain challenges and securing new equipment. You know, I think we've demonstrated that we've got a really strong platform that we can expand uh, geographically and we can push more products and services through. Ingrid's talked us through the numbers. You know, this business generates strong cash flow, high returns, and we've got a great opportunity to grow the business through m and as well. So that concludes uh, the, the slides. and uh, We'd be more than happy to take uh, questions now. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just while the team take a few moments to review those questions submitted already today, I'd like to remind you the recording of the presentation along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard on the Investor Meet Company platform. Um, if I may just hand over to you just to click on that Q&A tab and where appropriate to do so, if you could just read out the question and give your response, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, the first question, um, with the structural shift in oil and gas, how are you managing securing enough equipment and how does your funding availability impact your growth profile? Shall I answer the second half of that, Alan, you can do the first so part? I'll, so I'll take, I'll take the first part. You know, given the increase in market activity, we're ideally placed to benefit from this because we've got the biggest independent fleet uh, in the market. Uh, we have certainly seen an uh, increase in lead times for new equipment. Some of that is tied to the global shortage of uh, electronic chips, certainly for serving robotics equipment. But what that means is, you know, we need to do things quicker and earlier than we would necessarily have done in the past. So lead times can be anything from a few weeks to a few months to half a year at the moment. But we're making investment decisions on equipment that will last 10, 15, 20 years. And what we need to do is, is put orders in early. So we've already started uh, putting in orders for 23 capex, and we for for 22 uh, we put orders in probably a couple months earlier than we normally would. So by by being proactive, uh, we can certainly deal with uh, the supply chain challenges that we've got. We'll let Ingrid uh, talk about funding. Yeah, from a funding and um, availability perspective, we've got a 40 million pound RCF through HSBC and Clydesdale Bank that was put in place um, when the IPO last November. We've also got a £10 million accordion facility over and above. 
So we're at June, we were at 0.9 times uh, leverage, even with the drawdown for the V6E acquisition, uh, we'll be at less than one times um, by the year end. So there's still there's sufficient uh, availability of cash um, in terms of our existing facilities, um, but there's also open dialogue with, with banks at the moment to see you know, how far can we, we pull that. We're targeting a one to two times uh, leverage in the medium term. So the next question is visibility of revenue. Can you talk through what you typically see in your order book? So I think the first point there is that we're not a backlog business. You know, we've got good visibility out probably you know, two months. Uh, however, our top 10 customers are very stable. Uh, about 50% of our revenue comes from the top 10 customers. We talk to them on a daily basis. You know, with some customers, we sit in their weekly planning meetings. We've got really good visibility on what they're tendering, what their vessel scheduling is like. And, and because a consequence of that, we can forecast with with very good accuracy. However, you know, as I say, we don't have a backlog. Our average project duration is something like 47 days. So this is a high volume, high turnover uh, business. Um, next one, who are our, our main competitors and estimated market share? So we've got a number of competitors uh, on the survey and audit side. The top three are all private equity backed. Uh, one being Citronix, which is part of the Actian Group, which is KKR backed. Unique Maritime, which is backed by Blue Water Energy. And the third one being Subsea Technology Rentals, uh, which is backed by Bear Capital. Our biggest competitor in the survey and robotics space is actually our customers. We own probably 65% of the equipment in the market. So we would estimate our market share in survey and robotics to be about 20%. Um, of the of the rental market. When it comes to mechanical solutions, it's highly fragmented. So we've got competitors in cutting, we've got competitors in dredging, we've got competitors in ROV tooling. So it's very difficult to actually work out what our market share is there, but we see that as an area that is ripe for market consolidation and, uh, and we're progressing a number of opportunities uh, in that direction. So, do you expect the current energy crisis to feed into meaningful increase of demand for your services? So that is a good question. Um, you know, our view is that there has been a fundamental change in the outlook uh, for energy. For sure, the energy transition is, uh, is, is gathering momentum and you know, offshore wind is a major part of our business now. You know, it makes up you know, more than 30% of our revenues. I think what had been overlooked in the past is the place the oil and gas can play in the energy transition. And gas in particular is very much part of that transition. I think the events in Ukraine and the impact on pricing, not only in oil and gas, but also in, in other forms of power, means that there does need to be focus on where energy is coming from. It needs to be secure, it needs to be affordable, and it also needs to be uh, sustainable. And I think all those factors uh, are, are positive for our business and will lead to increased demand for our services uh, going forward. The next one, um, are your increased staff numbers and inflation within staffing costs covered by increasing prices, i.e. will margins be affected? Obviously, inflation is um, a concern to, to all businesses at the moment. Um, the two areas that we see that, you know, is mostly around staff costs and in uh, capex costs but we fully expect that that will be covered by increased prices so we don't we're not anticipating any margins uh, to be affected and then over what period of time is equipment written off and how frequently do you have to do, undergo additional write-offs so we depreciate most of our equipment on um, it's five to seven years but the majority is over seven years the reality is that um, within that Within that, if you look after the equipment, if it's well maintained, the electronic equipment can uh, survive for sort of 10 to 12 years. Um, in terms of other write-offs, it's very rare that we would write any equipment off and it still has a, a network value. Um, if our, if our uh, equipment goes out on hire to customers and they damage it, it's written into our terms and conditions that they effectively pay for that. So when you see um, our P&L, you'll see there is a, an other operating income line that is the, the profit we generate from the disposal of assets, and that is generally coming from 
um, our ability to, to charge our customers for damaged or lost equipment. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. I think you've covered all the questions that we've had through. And of course, if there are any further questions that come through, the company will be able to review all questions submitted there and publish responses where appropriate to do so. Alan, before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to you and the team, if I could just ask you for a few closing comments, please. Great. Thanks so much. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, you know, we have been encouraged by the progress that we've made as, as a PLC uh, through the first half of this year. Um, you know, there is a number of factors that we've talked about that are you know, supporting the growth runway for this business. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can do. And from an investment perspective, you know, we believe that we can provide, or through, through Ashley Technology, we can provide exposure to the international offshore energy market, not only uh, oil and gas, but also, also uh, offshore wind, in an asset-like basis which is quite a unique proposition on, uh, on, on, the, on the market. So thank you very much uh, for your, your interest and um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to uh, continue doing these broadcasts in, in the future as well. That's fantastic, Alan Ingrid. Thank you very much indeed for updating investors today. Can I please ask investors not to close the session? You'll be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order the team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and those greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Ashton Technology Holdings PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That concludes today's session. Thank you and good afternoon to you all.